when top cable network FX announced American Horror Story Delicate, which is the 12th season of the Supernatural anthology series created by Glee's Ryan Murphy, there was one particular A-list name that caught the most headline attention. Miss Kimberly K. Skin Skims Komodno Komoji Shudazzle Kardashian the First. By taking her first major acting role on American Horror Story, Kim Kardashian joins the likes of Lady Gaga, Patti Lapone and Patti LaBelle as the latest example of the showrunner's signature technique of stunt casting, which refers to the publicity stunt of using an unexpected celebrity to fill a role in TV, film, or theater as a means of generating buzz. It's a media gimmick that the American Horror Story franchise has long embraced to keep drawing in viewers for the unsubstantial shock tactics and plot twists that prop up an otherwise bewildering fever dream delirium storyline. And this year, we are witnessing a stroke of genius from the casting department who are, once again, attempting to prevent the cancellation of American Horror Story by dusting off this rapidly fading TV cornerstone with low ratings and an almost pathetic need for relevancy and giving her a part on their TV show, which also happens to have the same exact sentence as their Wikipedia summary. I mean, you just can't put a price on that kind of search engine optimization, except for the monetary value that experts could easily assigned to that metric, which is exceedingly low. Wow, have I always been this bad at using persuasive language? Quick, turn off your brains while you listen to me. Just take in the loud, loud bombastic, bombastic confidence. confidence. Because that's the kind of viewer who will also enjoy AHS Delicate, featuring other stars such as Emma Roberts and Cara Delevingne in a concept that feels completely fresh and original. Unless you've seen The Omen, or Rosemary's Baby, or season one of American Horror Story. Hey, I said, turn off your brain. Voice so loud, make happy. Inflection strong. Nailed it. So grab your twist up contour sticks and prepare for the satanic insemination of another literally so dark and so evil and almost antichrist installment of Clip Breakdown. television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we break it down like the gaslit woman who we wanna the get pregnant with the devil to look at each individual clip and decide if it's a healthy trimester of the New World Order or if it's um <laughs> an undergrown fetus. Oh, it's a lot of birth talk today, let's go ahead and issue a trigger warning for those who are in IVF because this whole storyline, although it's basically Rosemary's baby just modernized, at least from what I can tell from the first episode, is also a little inconsiderate of Kim Kardashian who knows, according to the Kardashian series on Hulu, that Khloe Kardashian, her sister, is having trouble connecting with her newborn baby who was delivered via IVF because she feels like perhaps on some level it's harder to love a child maternal that you did not give birth to. And that kind of theme comes up a lot in this first episode alone, and I'm assuming throughout the rest of the series, but mama, we'll get into it first. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. That way I know you want to see even more breakdowns and breakdowns of clip breakdowns on American Horror Story, other Ryan Murphy series. Baby, I've seen every episode of Glee. Don't get me started. Love to nip tuck. That's it. Oh, also, most importantly, I would love if you could click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I'm working tirelessly to upload new ones, and the only reward I get is like, well, like, I get paid for it, but I would love if you click subscribe because that's that's helpful to that end. Anyway, enough about that. My baby, my antichrist baby is the dollar bill. A whole wad of them slipping out of my hole. Oh, we got to get started. <laughs> um, I got merch. I got a Patreon. But what you need to know is that the movie begins with Emma Roberts, iconic queen of bullying apparently on this set, but who I have loved watching on television since her days on Unfabulous on Nickelodeon every Sunday night. She's playing a slightly different role now that she and I are both in our 30s. She's looking to be a new mom, and I'm looking for a dog sitter who knows how to deworm. Either way, we see Emma. She's sleeping in her bed. You know she's pregnant, be or like wants to be pregnant because she's like touching her stomach.
stomach. I don't know. At this point, she's had an egg implanted, but we'll find that out later. Right now, she's scared because she suddenly like opens her eyes and she's like, wait, is there another person in the bed with me who's not my husband? And I'm like, obviously it's not your husband. Your husband hates you. So she springs up and she's like, who in the hooded mystery man are you? And she's like, clearly a woman in the hood. So I just keep your eye out for all the women presenting characters in this show because one of them is the sneaky, sneaky bedroom stalker of Brooklyn Heights. Sweetheart, stop struggling with the immense weight of that front concrete door slab. You're going to permanently entomb yourself again. I don't know why she's so upset. She clearly told an interior designer to make her apartment shockingly uncomfortable. Did she somehow think that wouldn't include a strange hooded miscreant who's big spooning her in the middle of the night? Naive, new money. Like honey, that was a custom living stowaway and it cost you $8,000 at Restoration Hardware. So you basically just threw half of your bedroom furniture budget out onto the street. Nice. Listen, I would never judge a woman's survival instincts, her murder, her choice. But I do feel like if I ever woke up to a theatrical home invader centrally caressing my stomach, I probably wouldn't chase after them like we were playing freeze tag. She was like, oh, are you done leaving bloody handprints on every surface? Let me walk you to your car. There are some real weirdos out here at night. Like girl, let that person leave. You are gonna what? Apprehend them? Citizens arrest? They just touched where your baby lives. Anyway, she goes back in her room. She sees blood blood everywhere, realizes I guess that something bloody happened, we don't know. But flash back to one week earlier. Oi. I'm not trying to sound mean, but this is some satanic simpleton nonsense. Truly hair raising performances. Oh, did somebody mention hair and how good my hair looks? Thank you. I would like to thank also the sponsor of today's video. The secret to my fuller looking hair is MD hair. I introduced you to MD hair a few months ago on this channel and guess what mama, I'm still using it. Personally, I can't help but sometimes look at photos or see my hair in the past and be like, oh, I wish I didn't see so much scalp. And I wanna take care of my body for as long as I can, which is why I only would partner with a hair care product that I feel like is actually gonna be effective and worth the money. And MD hair definitely fits the bill. What I love is how you get everything you need in a full kit. And each item that comes in my MD hair regrowth kit is custom chosen to help improve the appearance and fullness and even help regrow my hair using super effective, proven, and natural ingredients. For regrowth to happen, you need to stop the hair loss, make the hair stronger, and treat the scalp, which is honestly only going to happen effectively if you approach it throughout your entire hair care routine. I'm talking shampoo and conditioner, serum, and supplements working from the inside out over time. This serum is such a luxurious experience, and over time, I'm not seeing flakes, I'm not seeing as much breakage on my pillows, and I'm frankly seeing better looking hair. It's a miracle. MD Hair will utilize the result of a short and simple quiz as well as AI technology that analyzes a scalp photo to create a customized treatment kit that gets all of the right ingredients into your hands chosen according to your personal needs. Whether you are a 50 year old with postmenopausal issues, a new mom in their 30s, or someone like me with like hereditary pattern baldness, there's a different combination of root causes for all of those different situations. And the fact that I know each of these products was specifically chosen to work with one another sparks joy every time I pick up these bottles. What I'm saying is it might be time to customize your hair growth treatment with MD hair. Use my promo code code Doramio70 to get your first month of customizable products at 70% off. That's code D-I-R-A-M-I-O-7-0 for 70% off your first month with MD Hair. One of the mm, really, I guess, relevant, although it's something, an abuse tactic that's always existed, but has become more relevant now that we're all like fluent in therapy talk is the concept of gaslighting. I mean, girl, poor Anne here, Emma Roberts' character, is gaslit by every old person, like from frame one and also treated unfairly. She's spoken down to, her medical needs are dismissed, her pain threshold is ignored. Basically, all of her agency is almost too obviously taken away from her by not only her husband, but also the care team at this creepy cement hard edge like hospital where she gets all of her IVF treatments done. 
of which she's had two. The episode starts with her rushing from her Brooklyn Heights home to try to get to this appointment, which she could have sworn was at nine. She checked it several times, but the husband's like, no, you idiot. It's at eight. You gotta get down here or they won't see you. So she's like rushing through the subway. She sees a creepy lady. All of this stuff won't matter till later episodes, which I'm telling you, I won't be watching. By the way, one of the reasons I knew when this was filming was because of how Kim Kardashian publicized her on-set job duties when she was shooting the season. And also because she was caught crossing picket lines when she was entering a hotel to do rewrites with Ryan Murphy when no union writers were available to rewrite. She was holding a script for episode three that she just had to be photographed with to remind us all she was gonna be a real bona fide television actress. And they're like, you know who else is? F***ing Roseanne Barr. We don't take that seriously either. Maybe you are not broken. We have unexplained infertility like 30% of other couples. Okay, it's only unexplained because the two of you refuse to admit to your doctor that your sex is exclusively anal. It's not gay as long as one of you has long, unstyled hair extensions. And I see that Anne has you covered. Even with the help of union writers, one thing you gotta love about Ryan Murphy is his super subtle, semi-educational after-school special dialogue. We just heard Johnny's statistics over here combine the power of verbal exposition with the world-building drama of data sets and values. He said, honey, I will love you even if you're failing to ovulate, like 40% of women with fertility issues, according to the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Babe, I'd be like, okay, nothing's even happened yet, but I can already tell you met the devil just by the way you're talking down to me. Like you just Googled the thing that's happening in my uterus. Centipedes in my vagina? I'll let you know their names. That's the old saying. My vagina centipedes, my choice in naming them. Okay, so she goes in for the implantation of these egg cells. This is all very Shane Dawson, isn't it? The title sequence is oh so off-putting. There's like all these mechanical noises and shots of like old, C-section tools from the Stone Age. I was like, you really are just bathing this in corn syrup, aren't you? Such a empathetic man to the, the experience of infertility suffering people, aren't you, Ryan Murphy? Ryan O'Murphy, maker of Glee, along with Chuck Falachuk. And who cares? Those shows start to suck the more you watch them. And yes, you may have heard that Emma Roberts had to apologize to a co-star for making allegedly transphobic comments on set and just generally not being a nice person to work with. That's not okay. But I do personally think it's cool how the digital streaming age means prestige actors like Julia Roberts' niece aren't afraid to do TV shows like they once were. In fact, Emma Roberts is an A-lister in part because of series like this. And it's refreshing to see Hollywood would change his perspective. 10 years ago, it would have seemed like a step down to go from starring in movies to starring in a TV show, which is crazy. It's hard to believe big name performers used to be afraid that taking a job on network TV would appear embarrassing or undignified. Yes, I studied drama at the Royal Academy, and yes, I've performed on Broadway, but everything that I truly needed to learn about acting, I learned while sitting on the toilet. Nothing says to the world, I've been in a theater troupe, like squatting on the toilet in an uptown apartment at night. After coming home from the doctor with an embarrassing new prescription, shoulders hunched forward in degradation as you insert the suppository. Everybody, I'm scared. I think the ghost of an aged Broadway legend just possessed my body to perform one more melodramatic monologue. I'm lying because that's actually just what my real voice and personality sound like and they're slipping through the cracks. I used to visit the clinic with venereal diseases so scabby the student nurses would kill themselves. Oh, shut up, Nicholas, you old broad. Aside from the unsettling way that her skincare products are laid out, Anne is just not having a pleasant bathroom experience. After inserting her suppository, which must stay refrigerated, I guess they're made of eggnog, she starts pulling a hair out of her head and it's like super long, it grows forever. I was like, the devil treats hair loss now? What's their number? But the weirdness is just getting started for Anne. And you need to hold on because here comes Kim Kardashian. Then tell the Daniels to suck my clit. She's not missing a press day for a commercial shoot. I'll tell them, Miss Corbin, but does that mean you also want production to reschedule the commercial? Great, then I'll make sure that also gets captured on the list of actionables right after the clit sucking. Sometimes she's such a high-powered girl boss that she forgets to provide actual instructions after saying something rude and unprofessional. But we can look past that. It's her first office job and acting job. Yeah, we got it. Everybody, I want you to meet Kim Kardashian's leading role, Miss Siobhan Corbin. She's the publicist 
for up and coming starlet Anne here, who we learn in this scene was struggling before this latest indie film that came out called The Auteur. She was like a former child star from, it looks like an OC style show. Although the logo on the box of the toys she's signing from her old fans, it looks more like the um, logo for Zoe 101 and they use Emma Roberts like old 12 year old headshot or 16 or whatever. So they are kind of like playing up this idea in stunt casting, you know, ways of alluding to the fact that Emma Roberts is a child star who is now breaking into adulthood. And I guess that's a similar experience and parable to like having demon babies crawl out of your puss. It's the same essential truth, right? We all know. Anyway, Siobhan here is a true ball buster, as they would say. This is the New York market, so she can swear all she wants, and she's wearing pale lipstick with brown lip liner, like it's 2015 again. We love that for her. After these two met, basically Siobhan replaced Anne's old publicist, and she's taking a much more active role, having Anne sign headshots, and she even gives Siobhan this doll, and is like, no, the fan wants you to sign it on the body of the doll itself and she's like that's so weird and she's like fans are weird I would be like yeah but also what the f who is sending you these toys for me to sign and you send them back to them like this is not a thing it's not a thing celebrities wouldn't do that right I mean maybe but I don't get it it seems weird to me regardless we get a taste of how up-and-coming Miss Anne Margaret really is oh my god this just came in Andy Cohen wants to interview you alone without even a Bravo Liberty in the other chair this would be your first late night show. You couldn't ask for a better start than winning over thousands of tipsy wine moms and their 12 gay friends who still use Facebook. Babe, if you can make it through this three hour shoot without calling your makeup artist a colorblind fat I should be able to get you a spot on the Comcast Xfinity parade float during WeHo Pride. So far, the only purpose of Kim Kardashian's character is to tell Emma Roberts' character information that her character would already know, just to make everything nice and convenient for the audience. Kim is here just to move things forward, but without moving her forehead. She said, Andy Cohen demands that every guest arrives on time and having fully douched before the show. Every time Kim's character speaks, you can almost hear Ryan Murphy struggling with the fact that he can't start the very first episode using a voiceover that says, and here's, here's what, what you missed on Glee. Glee. But eh, doesn't matter. Just give Kim the recap as unrealistic dialogue. She needs the practice. They give her plenty of lines on this show and none of them quite fit the show. Like, I mean, I've seen Ryan Murphy shows where he hires basically non-actors or very inexperienced actors to play lead roles. And it's sometimes works and sometimes it's like, okay, why is that person in a school play while that person's on Fox Fridays? Kim Kardashian is giving school play. Like she seems really proud of herself for memorizing all of the sentences, but she's vacant behind the eyes and she has the inflection of Kim Kardashian reading a script. It's not how she talks naturally. She's not bringing herself to the role. She doesn't seem like she's having fun at all. And this character is, I think, supposed to be fun. I think it was supposed to be funny that Kim Kardashian, who's very poised and very perfect and rarely caught being crass, except for when she said she was gonna eat a bowl of poop every day if it helped make her beautiful. It's like, what? Okay, who? no one asked you to say that. It's fun and unique and we're gonna laugh at the screening because you're in an audience when you see, hear her say, suck, sucking cl it's funny when I say it too. <laughs> anyway, here's Kim. You're suddenly an A-list star after spending years on the CW before you did a low budget indie that we all thought would wind up in the bargain bin at Walmart. Why are you talking to me like somebody with no short term memory who has to rediscover themselves every day? I told you, I haven't suffered from a head injury. My skull is just really flat on the top. Seriously, there is no life in these line deliveries. I feel like the more lines they give her, the more measured and rehearsed and laborious they start to sound. Like that clip we just saw, she was fully upstaged by that expressive background actor. Listen, you're suddenly an A-list star <laughs> after spending years on the CW applying sunscreen with a smoldering stare. Kim, get out of the way. You're blocking someone who knows how to perform with confidence. I feel like she's telling the story of how she climbed the corporate ladder until the sun'll come out tomorrow. But don't worry, it's not just Siobhan who spews verbal exposition all throughout the show, which reminder was shot during the writer's strike of 2023. And oh boy, does it show. 
This show had no writers. There are so many instances of characters just unnaturally stating who they are and where they come from and how they relate to this specific storyline. They might as well all be wearing name tags and handing me a resume like a job fair for Bed Bath & Beyond. It's hard for me to talk about your IVF journey since mine didn't work. We relate to the appointment I flew in on a red eye from Berlin to make. Meeting you at that IVF support group. She was my wife. She was your best friend. I'm an actress, you're a publicist. Can I make it any more obvious? Almost every single character is verbally identified by how they fit into the show, or they're giving out personal information about themselves that the person they're talking to would already know. The husband is like, I'm secretly one of the bad guys, but you don't know it yet. And Kim is like, your favorite food is vegetables. Like, okay, you could have found another way to tell us that, is what I'm saying. Like, Siobhan had that whole other scene where she's like, fans are weird. Andy Cohen wants to suck your d and it's like, any of that could have been like, I knew from the moment I saw you at the f***ing Connections IVF Infertility Survivors meeting that your career was gonna take off much faster than that horribly named support group. You know, like, I literally just made that up and I'm happier with the dialogue than whatever that was. I was born to write TV hypothetically and tell you about it on YouTube. But hey, I'm happy that the writers got what they were looking for in that strike, from what I hear. Let me know if you're a union writer down below. Are the strike terms out yet? And are we winning on the media home front? Let me know. Anyway, as we saw in the park, it's like, God, how many outdoor meeting space conversations does this woman need to have? Go home and rest, eat some folate. You're a non-working actress, fresh off a Oscar nominated movie. You don't need to be out in the cold air. But the husband is like, my wife, Madeline, Adeline, she died in an accident. And Anne is like, you don't have to talk about her, but you kind of do, or I don't trust you. So he's like, the way that she died, so bloody, so many infertility moments to come up. Adeline becomes a part of the story now because Anne even does some research online and the public typically is like, they loved Adeline and they don't think that Anne measures up as a secondary girlfriend. So we're bringing in some commentary about how cruel the internet consuming public can be when they weigh in on the personal lives of celebrities. And though is further gaslit when she comes home, her vag suppositories are rotting on the counter like stale bananas. And the husband is like, oh, you're under a lot of stress on all of this medication. No wonder you can't do something simple, you stupid, stupid woman. And she's like, I put them away, I put them away. And also like the medications she's on are probably like ibuprofen and vitamins. I don't know why that would mess with her memory, but let's just keep walking. Anne follows her husband to dinner, a fancy restaurant with two of his friends. One of them is this woman who's like got a British accent and she's a high power gallery owner who he, the husband who is an art dealer or something is helping her find a new artist and the artist looks like Adeline, Adelaide, whatever. The woman is like, oh my God, everyone loved Adelaide and everyone doesn't like you this much. And so whatever. Anne runs off to the bathroom feeling less than and calls her best friend Siobhan who can't even act over the phone, turns out. What's your biggest fear? That my eggs are so old and dusty, my baby's gonna come out a spider. If that does happen, I will help you raise this little spider baby as if it crawled out of my own womb. You're unbelievable. She literally is. Like, my brain doesn't for one second believe that Kim Kardashian is actually Siobhan Corbin, a trash mouth Irish lass with a faulty uterus. I feel like her lifeless line delivery makes all of this obvious foreshadowing for her character's secret motives even more obvious. First of all, all the promo shots of Kim Kardashian and show her as like some kind of spider lady. And now she's saying that if the baby were to come out a spider, she would help raise it as her very own, which is obviously what she's trying to do. She's trying to make this spider baby come out of her secretly and then raise it like her own as the foster mom of the Antichrist or whatever, because she couldn't have a baby of her own. She probably got sucked into this de devil cult or that's what we're gonna think halfway through the season and then they twist it around and she's actually the good witch of the North. Either way, we're supposed to recognize that moment of dialogue later if we rewatch the series, which please don't. And then when Anne is like, you're unbelievable, it's meant to signify that like, yeah, we shouldn't believe her. She's not to be trusted. Like we get it. Siobhan befriended Anne to move this Rosemary's baby satanic cult plan into action. The other lady comes back in. She's like, oh, you were the best friend of Adelaide. You can talk about her. It's fine. She apologizes. She sees some shoes under the thing. She's looking at her phone and she thinks it gets hacked because her appointment for the fertility implantation gets moved right before her eyes. The main takeaway, 
throughout all of this is that Siobhan, although probably the least convincing actor out of all of these characters, is not the only one with stilted dialogue or bad performances. Let's check out Anne when she finally sees Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live. Andy, you are absolutely right. And I did kill someone for the part. But I can't tell you who. No one will miss him. Tom Sandoval. Oh, no, but I f Tom Sandoval to get on this show. Oh, can I... Yeah. Sweetheart, there are no writers here. You can say whatever you want. Like, the finished screenplay for this episode included rewrites submitted by Kim Kardashian and the customer service chat bot from Ticketmaster.com. So I think it's fine. The only Emmy we're campaigning for this year is show with the longest wig. Why is Emma's acting so forced and awkward in this scene? And who the f is Tom Sandoval? She said, I had to f Tom Sandoval. Ooh, can I say that? Like what, Emma? The director of this episode was probably like, I told her that she was allowed to be herself and just get on set and have fun. And then she just immediately started bullying her transgender castmates. I thought, okay, that was an interesting way of interpreting my note. Again, despite uh, her reportedly problematic onset behavior, throughout her time on American Horror Story, Emma Roberts has proven herself to be a very competent actor, which is why I was surprised by the contrived and rushed manner of her acting in this scene. It's like an SNL character. She said, as a matter of fact, I did kill a person for this role, but I can't tell you who, although I've never felt more alive. And I'll give you a hint. It was not Chuck E. Cheese, although I did that pizza rat on a pile of shredded cheese in a dumpster. Oops, can I say that? Shredded cheese, is that allowed? Like. Have you been in your dressing room sniffing nail polish remover to prepare for this scene? These acting choices would only have made sense to me if they were trying to show that Anne was actually having a hard time coming off personable in interviews. And that was like an obstacle towards her A-list rise to fame. I think that could have led to some interesting commentary on how the media consuming public has these expectations of women who are stars to always be warm and inviting and happy and polite. And if not, they have resting or they're cold ice queens. But instead, Anne is just genuinely written as though what we just saw comes off as funny and nice and warm. You're so much more charming than most people. Most people who are being held hostage by the Joker and then forced to read his demands in a videotape for the Batman? Because that whole episode of Watch What Happens Live was giving under extreme duress vibes. Big blink twice for no en energy. I'm just saying, since we met Anne at the beginning of this episode, we have never once seen her interact normally with another human Human being, especially not in a way that could seem charming. She's been jumpy, sarcastic, avoidant, erratic, sitting on a toilet. Her hair is six feet long. She's complaining about a stalker in her house. Like, girl, just get it together. We all live with dark entities that frighten us on a nightly basis. It's called being a homeowner. For me, it's that really big spider that I trapped under a clear plastic cup in the bathroom. And the bloody face of a woman who died in my bedroom that appears behind me in the mirror sometimes, but I don't mind that one as much. She lets me do her makeup sometimes. But the spider is like makeup a web inside the cup now. Oh, I'm gonna puke. Remember that doll that Anne was asked to sign as an autograph, but I believe will be revealed to be uh, like some sort of satanic rite of passage ritual. She's starting the process of this devil insemination. Devil insemination. By the way, Anne is now being like looked at by the doctor and the husband and everyone as like a bad mom who doesn't really want this bebe because she rescheduled the insemination for the day after her Watch What Happens Live interview, which Saban is pushing her to be like, it's so important. I know that her name is Siobhan and it's like this Irish spelling that uses B. So I'm saying Saban, it's crazy town. This is, let me know in the comments how wrong it is, but girl, Ireland. Anyway, <laughs> Anne gets back in her bedroom after apparently killing it <laughs> in that horrible interview and the doll is like sitting there with an X on its stomach and it's like, eh, like the most horror movie type of doll ever. And she gets no empathy. She's on. Oh my God, Andy's so funny. I'm sorry, Siobhan, are you saying that as a joke, you think Andy Cohen, Bravo's former executive vice president of development and talent and current host of this show, snuck into the dressing room of a celebrity guest that he's never met before to creepily position a discontinued doll that looks like her as a teenager with an X drawn across its stomach. And then after making that wild assumption, your reaction is that it's so funny. You can see the lack of acting ability in her reaction before before she even says that line where she's like, oh my God, Andy's so funny. Like you are not thinking like your character there. You're just doing a thing before saying the line. There's no motive. But on the character level, Siobhan is being really dismissive of this doll, suspiciously so since just in the dressing room before the show, 
She was validating Anne's fear over the weird stalkery things happening in her home by saying that it's very common for women in media to be harassed. So they're almost making it too obvious that she's involved with a satanic cult that's gaslighting a demon baby into Anne. It's so obvious from the get-go that I will be surprised if it doesn't flip that back around and make it like a complex thing where she's redeemable by like trying to make her baby come back from hell or whatever. Like if it's really just like on its face, she's like the best friend in Rosemary's baby, then like it's one of the bad guys, then like this is too simple of writing. Also, we see how long Emma Roberts' hair is. I think she's gonna do the other Rosemary's baby trope and cut it short at some point. But beyond that, my concern is that due to Kim's portrayal, I'm never going to feel a sense of betrayal or intimidation when her true evil intentions are revealed. Just wait until episode six when a robed figure lowers its hood to reveal Siobhan here in a slicked back wet hair look. And she'll be like, did you really think I was your friend, Anne? That is so funny. Like it literally fingers my funny hole. Bible, I mean satanic Bible which is an upside down Bible. I'm like, you know what? Take my baby, take my demon baby. I don't care, send me to hell. Drag me to hell too. The next day, whatever, Anne goes, gets her thing implanted, but really she's like half awake and this old lady who's been following her pukes blood into her French kiss mouth. It's a lot. And I'm gonna let you know one more thing. I do wanna see where this goes, but not by following the show every week after week. So let me know if I should jump on board again for the last episode or somewhere in the middle, because Ryan Murphy is really, really killing me these days. And I wanna talk about it. But more importantly, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. That way I know you wanna see more Ryan Murphy clip breakdowns. Also, don't forget to click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. Tap that notification bell icon and you'll always be the first to know when I'm delivering via C-section the spawniest devil spawn that you've ever lawn on. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus episodes and virtual watch parties. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for puking curdled blood into my open mouth today in a lover's kiss. I will see you next time.